Hi and welcome to Abnormal Psychology. Now in this chapter we're going to be exploring anxiety, obsessive compulsive, and tra trauma and stress related disorders. So that's an example of how it is in terms of the grouping of things together. So first let's consider this scenario. On the afternoon in her abnormal psychology test, Betty is experiencing a number of noticeable but mild symptoms of anxiety. Her body is tense, her heart is beating a little faster than usual, and she has a few worried thoughts moving through her mind. Things like, did I study enough to do well as I wanted on this test? Sitting next to Betty is Dave. Now Dave, whose symptoms are more severe, Dave's heart is pounding out of his chest. His breathing is quick and shallow. Now quick and shallow breathing puts a stressor on the brain. It hits the amygdala, that's the old part of the brain around survival, and sh quick shallow breathing alerts the amygdala. We're not getting enough oxygen and starts to increase anxiety and preparing to flight or fight. And he has a number of worried thoughts, although they are different in content and far more distressing than those of Betty's. Now Dave is worried that he's going to have a panic attack during the test. And he is frantically scanning the test room to check out all the exits should he feel the need to escape. Furthermore, he is a very, he's very worried that others were going to notice his anxiety symptoms and that this will be so very embarrassing for him. To top it all off, he also has the test to worry about. Both Betty and Dave are experiencing signs of, and symptoms of anxiety. Betty's anxiety is fairly typical of what many students experience before important tests. However, Dave's symptoms are much more severe, causing him more discomfort and impairment in his ability to concentrate. Now, Dave may get up and leave the test before it begins. Now, this topic, well, it's going to be um, with the remaining disorders will be in three parts, as I have mentioned. In part one, we're going to review the variety and the types of anxieties-based disorders. In part two, we're going to look at the theoretical perspectives of how these disorders come about. And then lastly, in part three, we'll consider the treatment options for each category of disorder. So I want to be able to begin to remind you again, please do not self-diagnose or diagnose others. Anxiety ranges from an appropriate normal amount and experience of anxiety to extreme and that's what's really important for us to make a distinction about. So to begin this chapter we can start with a definition really of what is anxiety and it's important to remember um, and it's important I'm going to keep harping on this but it's important to remember that with every category of psychological disorders, there, any one of us might be able to say, well, that sounds a lot like me, or I do that sometimes. And so I emphasize, we all need to keep in mind the six categories for determining abnormality. Remember in chapter one, and again, I'll say, do not self-diagnose. So by definition, you know, anxiety is a general sense of apprehension or fear is normal and desirable under some circumstances. You should have anxiety in some circumstances. That's appropriate. But it can become abnormal when it's excessive or inappropriate in terms of time or space. Now, anxiety may be experienced with a range of physical features cognitions, now remember cognitions means thinking, and behaviors, the things that we do. Let's look at those, just break them down just a little bit here. Physical features can include jumpiness, the jitters, increased perspiration and heart rate, shortness of breath, dizziness, and nausea. The cognitive features, our thinking, could include excessive or prolonged worrying 
only aware of the bodily sensations and jumbled thoughts and nagging thoughts. And then the behavioral features can include the need to escape or avoid the situation. Remember, the fight or flight is oftentimes connected to the lack of oxygen and the shortness of breath. So that's the avoid or escape the situation. Agitation is part of the behavioral features. Clinginess, the need for reassurance. Now disorders involving anxiety were historically uh, classified as neuroses, which were originally believed to be of some organic nature. The psychodynamic theory posits that the origins of neuroses lay in the psychological factors that neuroses reflected the threat of conscious emergence of repressed, unacceptable impulses. Now, you might remember, and I hope you do, that that's based on Freud's work. Freud believed that the different kinds of neuroses reflected the different ways in which the ego defended itself from anxiety. This etiological hypothesis united current anxiety, dissociative, and somatoform disorders as neuroses. Neuroses has not been used in the DSM since 1980. Instead, they consider only the sort of observable behaviors rather than the causation assumptions. So the DSM-5 considers dimensions of a disorder, anxiety disorder, panic disorder, specific phobias, social anxiety disorder, and generalized anxiety disorder. And we're going to look at each one of these. Panic disorder is the first form of anxiety disorder that we're going to look at. Now, in every one of these disorders, you are going to find a table that's going to look at the criteria that's based on the DSM-5. Now, if you check out table 3.2 in your e-text for the criteria, you'll see what is being used to diagnose. And you'll find that a lot of times it hasn't got to do with the occasional event. It's consistent and over time. So check that out for each one of the disorders. And we're starting with panic disorder. Now, panic disorder refers to a recurrent, so it's repeating, it's over time, continues. It's unexpected panic attacks. Now, there's a criteria A, that's what that is. A panic attack is an abrupt surge of intense fear and intense discomfort that reaches a peak within minutes, and during which time four or five of the list of 13 um, physical and cognitive symptoms will occur. Now again, that's in table 3.2, and there's a list there. So you have to have not just one or two, there needs to be several of those. The worries about panic attacks or their consequences usually pertain to physical concerns such as worry that the panic attack reflects um, the presence of a life-threatening illness, social concerns such as the embarrassment or the fear of being judged negatively by others because of the visible panic symptoms, and concerns about mental functioning such as I feel like I'm going crazy or just losing control. And that's criterion B. Now there have been two exclusions or exclusion criteria for panic disorder. The disorder cannot be due to the use of substances like drugs or medication. And that makes sense because if it is the use of drugs or medication, then it's the drugs and medication that are the source of the panic and not a psychological disorder. The second is that can't be based on a medical condition and the disorder cannot be explained by a comorbid disorder, meaning it occurs at the same time. Panic disorder is often comorbid with another disorder, namely agoraphobia. About one third to one half of people with panic disorder also have agoraphobia. The majority of people with agoraphobia have a history of panic attacks. So that's where it's a comorbid and it, they're linked. In the new DSM-5, agoraphobia is a distinct disorder involving the fear, 
concerns and anticipate anticipatory anxiety or excessive worry about being in open spaces or being in closed spaces, using public transportation, standing in line, being in crowds, and in general, any place outside the home environment. Agoraphobia is diagnosed separately from panic disorder. If both exist, then there's two diagnoses would be given. The next disorder we'll look at is what's known as GAD. GAD or generalized anxiety disorder and it's characterized by a persistent feeling of anxiety that are not triggered by any specific object situation or activity but rather seem to be what Freud labeled as free floating people with GAD are chronic worriers chronic worrying is accompanied by general feelings of dread, foreboding, and a heightened states of sympathetic arousal. So that's the part of your body's system that you don't control. Now, another one that you're probably a little more familiar with, because you maybe know people who have a phobic disorder involving phobias, which are these excessive irrational fears of specific objects or situations. Now, phobias involve a behavioral component of avoidance of a specific, you know, avoidance of the phobic stimuli, whatever that happens to be, and we'll get into that in a minute. In addition to the physical and cognitive features, specific phobias are excessive fears of particular objects or situations. Now, there are five forms or five types of phobias. The first type is an animal type. This is where one's phobia or fear is around spiders, snakes, dogs, you know, and the like, animals. Secondly is natural environment type. So this is where any fears of height, storms, water, natural environment type. Three, blood injection injury type. So people who find a particular fear and avoid seeing blood or receiving an injection. Four is a situational type. People who find fear about being in planes or elevators, it's a particular situation that creates the phobic response. And then five, it's a general term of other types. So, for example, a phobia of choking or, a, or contracting an illness or a disease or fear of clowns would fit into the fifth category. Social anxiety disorder is another in the next one of anxiety disorders we're going to look at. It, it involves an intense fear of being judged negatively by others. It's normal to feel uncomfortable or nervous on first dates or in social gatherings where you don't know very many people or to make a presentation in front of a class. That's, you're supposed to feel anxious most of the time. With social anxiety disorder, this is intense and almost paralyzing experience. Again, it meets the criteria for what is an abnormal behavior. Remember chapter one. Now this one, if you're a parent, you may have had some awareness of with children sometimes. Separation anxiety disorder. Now separation anxiety disorder is a childhood disorder characterized by extreme fears of separation from parents or others with whom that child is dependent. The development of a separation anxiety disorder frequently follows a stressful life event such as an illness or death of a relative or a pet or a change in schools and homes and creates a great deal of stress and that may translate into this separation anxiety disorder. So some perspectives on anxiety disorder in childhood. Well the psychoanalytic theorists argue that childhood anxieties and fears like their adult counterparts symbolize unconscious conflicts. The cognitive theorists tend to focus on the role of cognitive bias, underlying anxiety's reaction. Learning theorists, 
They suggest that the occurrence of generalized anxiety may touch on broad themes such as fear of injection or rejection or fear of you know, fear of failure that carry across situations. And so it's a learned experience. The next group is a group that um, is a challenging one. It's with the obsessive compulsive and related disorders. We're going to begin with the obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD involves recurrent patterns of obsessions, compulsions, or the combination of the two. People with OCD can be preoccupied with obsessions and or compulsions for several hours a day and experience significant distress. Remember, compulsions, you know, and, and obsessions aren't choices. And that's an important distinction we need to make sure we're clear on. So as a way of our definition, we need to keep in mind that it's a preoccupation with obsessions and, and or compulsions for several hours a day and experience significant distress messing with their normal functioning and routines of day. Obsessions are intrusive, persistent thoughts or urges that create anxiety and seem beyond the person's ability to control. They can include such things as checking and rechecking doors, windows, or make sure they're not locked, or excessively concerned with germs, or touching people, or things where germs may be transferred. Compulsions are irresistible, repetitious urges to perform certain behaviors such as repeated, elaborate washing, after using the bathroom or mental acts like praying or repeating certain phrases. Now, compulsions are not fun or lightweight. They are things that one, that one is uncomfortable, un uncomfortable and uncontrollably driven to do. A person who experiences OCD can at times see the irrationality of what is being and what they're obsessing about or the rituals that they may engage with. However, without treatment, these obsessions and compulsions will continue. Now, this is why I will correct people who say that, um, that OCD is kicking in or someone who is genuinely diagnosed with OCD knows it doesn't just kick in once in a while. It's constant and debilitating. And so that's why I say, please, be careful how you express yourself around things that occur to you. If you have not been diagnosed, be careful about using terms sort of loosely. Now, if we were to, if we're looking at this a little further, a little more depth, the trauma and stress related disorders, there's two primary forms. There's an adjustment disorder and acute and post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Adjustment disorders are among the mildest of psychological disorders. An adjustment disorder is a maladaptive reaction to an identified stressor that develops within a few months of the onset of the stressor. The maladaptive reaction is characterized by significant impairment in social, occupational, or academic functioning, or by the states or, or by the states of emotional distress are exceeded uh, these normal induced by stressor. So if you look at, um, let me think, table 3.8, you'll see a little breakdown of what is included. As with most of these disorders, one of the criteria include length of time experiencing the effects. Not the one or two times over a month, but often over the lengthy period of time. The reaction may be resolved if the stressor is removed or the individual learns to adapt to it successfully. In acute and post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, people develop stress reactions that follow exposures to traumatic events. Acute stress disorder occurs in the days and the weeks following exposure to a traumatic event. Notice I didn't say 
war or conflict, traumatic event can be a wide variety. It's not limited to people who've experienced war. Post-traumatic stress disorder persists for months, even years or decades after the traumatic experience and may not begin until months or even years after the events. Features of PTSD um, reactions include extreme anxiety or dissociation. Now, dissociation is just like a feeling of being detached from one's own self and one's environment. You feel like you're at a loss. Intrusive memories and flashbacks, heightened arousal or vigilance, you're always on your edge and on your toes expecting something to happen, difficulty in concentrating. A Canadian, Romeo Dallier, the former head of the doomed United Nations peacekeeping mission in Rwanda, this is going back to the 1990s, was discharged from the military for PTSD a few years after the 1994 mission in which his forces tried in vain to stop the slaughter of 800,000 to a million Tutsis and, the, um, and moderate Hutus. He witnessed hideous crimes against humanity, genocide, as, ha as had many of the civilians living there. Dalliard suffers from PTSD, and in 2000, he attempted suicide by combining alcohol with his antidepressant medication, a near-fatal combination which left him comatose. He has gone on to become a Canadian senator since 2005, and his biography was made into a movie, Shake Hands with the Devil. Okay, that's looking at what are so a descriptor of what falls within anxiety disorders and obsessive compulsive trauma and stress related disorders it's a catchment and we've looked at those disorders that fall within that title now the next video that you can watch will be looking at causes the reasons for those occurrences through our different theoretical perspectives and then the third video that I'll do will be looking at treatments. And I'll do that for most of the videos throughout the semester. Some of them will be in two parts and some will be in three. Now in this particular course, if you check your syllabus, we have this chapter in week, what do I have it in? Week three and week four. It's quite possible I'll post all these videos in week three and none of them in week four. So you don't, if you go to week four and see no videos, check your syllabus as to why that is. All right. I hope you're doing well. See you in part two. Bye now.